So these are um, excerpts of some creative nonfiction from my thesis. For those of you that have read them before, I apologize. Um, they're not titled, just because, but I've numbered them, so we'll go with that. Anyways, this is seven. He was brought before the wall with the mysterious hand writing on it. A hand appeared out of the air, said the king. It wrote those words. The man nodded. You worked for my father, did you not? Continued the king. I have heard a great many stories about you. The man nodded. If you can read the words, I will make you third in power of all of my kingdom. The man shook his head. Keep your gifts and your flattery for yourself. I will tell you what it means. You did not heed the lesson of your father. He was raised higher than all nations because he loved justice and truth. Then he became prideful, drunk with power, and hardened his heart. He was brought down lower than the animals, his mind less than that of a beast. You, my king, have neither the greatness of your father nor his depravity. You are governed by a selfishness that tells you and your concubines to eat and drink with the vessels from God's most holy temple. The writing on the wall says this, the days of your kingdom are numbered. Your humanity has been weighed and found wanting. Your kingdom will be divided between your two greatest enemies. Every remnant of your house will be washed from this earth. The king stared at him, speechless. There is nothing you can do, the man continued. You made your bed, now you will die in it. Eight. Tell me, said the king, where is the God that will deliver you out of my hands? His three stewards said nothing, heads bent. A crowd gathered behind them. The king shook his head. If you do not bow before our God, you will burn. Your positions will not save you. The stewards remained silent. Go and double the heat of the furnace, the king shouted to a servant. Whispers rippled through the crowd in concentric circles. Then the first steward spoke. What did you say? asked the king. We will be delivered, he repeated, either in this life or the next. The king laughed. Tell me, do you really place so little value on your lives? Our lives are not ours, said the second of the three. Our lives belong to our God. However he wishes to place value in them, either in life or in death, they are his to take. The king replied, the fires are lit, the flames reach up towards the heavens and threaten to destroy the furnace. You have two choices. You can either be dead martyrs or live cowards. Which do you prefer? The crowd fell silent. The king adjusted the rings on his finger and waited. The three stewards raised their heads. The third man spoke. If this is so, then our God will deliver us from the furnace in your hands. If not, know, O king, that we will never bow before your gods. We will never worship the idol you have created or any other. The king rose from his throne. Bind them, he said, and to the men you will burn. And ten. He came, up to, he came running up to her, his eyes wide with fear. His clothing was soaked in blood, although he had few, if any, wounds. She recognized him as the king's general. Come, my lord, come quickly, she said to him, motioning to her husband's tent. You may rest and hide here until your men come for you. Thank you, he replied, breathless. Where is your husband? Out with the flock, she replied. He should return soon. The general nodded and entered the tent. May I have some water? I am very thirsty. She gave him instead their finest milk. Then he stretched out in a corner. She covered him with a heavy rug. As he fell asleep, he told her, stand guard outside. If anyone asks for me, tell them I am not here. She nodded. Outside, she finished the laundry. She made sure there was enough hay for the horses that would soon arrive. She refreshed the pitchers of water and milk. She fed the animals. Once all her tasks for the day were completed, she ventured back into the tent. The general was asleep. She smiled at his snores. Outside, she saw riders in the distance. They were coming towards her. 
She filled the basin with water. Then she pulled out a tent peg, grabbed a hammer, and went back inside. The general was snoring even louder. She smiled, crouching over his body, and whispered, your murderous rampage ends now. She placed the tent peg at the center of his temple. Gripping the hammer, she drove it into his skull. The general awoke, screaming. She said to him, tell your father in hell that you've been killed by a woman. She drove the peg further and further into his skull until his head was faceted to the ground. Then she washed the blood off her hammer. She changed clothes, soaking her bloody robes and the heavy carpet in the basin of water. When the riders arrived, she told them that she had the general. The men and the woman with them dismounted. They stared in awe at the body nailed to the ground. The woman rider said to their leader, I told you he would only be delivered into the hands of a woman. He smiled and replied, now we are free. Blessed be God and you, young executioner. They pulled the body free from the soil and tied it for, to one of their horses. Wait, the young executioner said. Before you leave, may I have one request? Their leader smiled broadly. Anything, name it. I will need the tent peg back, she said, motioning to a flapping section of the tent.